इट्स माई प्रेजर टू इंट्रोड्यूस टू यू डॉक्टर स्टीवन स्कीना हु इज़ अ डिस्टिंग्विश प्रोफेसर ऑफ कंप्यूटर साइंस एट टोनी ब्रुक यूनिवर्सिटी न्यू यॉर्क ही इज़ हेयर टू टॉक अबाउट हु इज़ बिगर क्वान्टिटेटिव एनालिसिस ऑफ हिस्टोरिकल फेम एज यू कैन सी ही हैज़ पब्लिश ओवर वन थर्टी पेपर्स इन कंपटेशनल जोमेट्री कंपटेशनल बायोलॉजी ग्राफ थियरी एंड डेटा माइनिंग ही इज़ ऑल्सो द ऑथर ऑफ फोर बुक्स including the algorithm design manual which is quite popular within google and elsewhere lastly he is also the uh, co-founder and chief scientist at uh, general sentiment a media measuring company uh, without further ado i'll uh, get professor on the podium i'd like to thank gautam okay thank you okay so um let me uh just say i'm very happy to be at google i have um several connections here uh One thing is a bunch of my students have been here over the years. Um, I think we've got like eight or nine full, full-time permanent alumni of our news and blog analysis project here. And um, it's a rite of passage for all my PhD students to spend summers here. So we've got uh, Rami here and uh, Yanping Chen in uh, um, you know, uh, Washington. Um, the other connection I guess I have here is that um, my understanding is that uh, you know, my, my, my algorithms book is a popular thing for people trying to get jobs at Google, you know, so when you, and uh, since many of you, I guess, have uh, jobs at Google, perhaps you've seen it, but uh, when Steve Yege recommended uh, my book at Google, my sales went up a lot, so I've always had a warm spot to Google for that reason. Um, but okay, let me talk about what I want to talk about here, which is um, we have a method or system that we don't want to talk about for trying to construct uh, relative rankings of historic figures. Um, it, it's a common thing in, um, you know, for, for there to be books and newspaper articles ranking the top 100 athletes in history or presidents in history or um, politicians or scientists or Italians or any other group that you can imagine. And so there's a, you know, it, it's a common thing to want to try to rank historical figures based on significance. Now, what we mean by historical significance is sub subjective and culturally biased and all that. But, um, but being able to rank people is interesting from a point of view of prioritization. I'll want to show you, is it interesting from a point of view of education? I'll show you there's some interesting analyses you can do if you can rank people by significance. So um, basically what this talk's going to be about is about a project we have to rank all the people in Wikipedia by significance, okay? And... Um, Let's try it just to see what we're doing. So who's bigger, okay, historically, historically more significant, George Washington or Abraham Lincoln? Who here says George Washington? A couple who here says Abraham Lincoln? A couple more. That's not a surprise. That's a split because we have Abe Lincoln as five and sixth among the most important historical figures. Um, the least important president we have is Chester Allen Arthur, who many of you may never have heard of. He came in at 490th. Um, during the 60s, John Lennon said that the Beatles were bigger than Jesus, okay? Is this true or false? Who's bigger, Jesus or um, John Lennon? Who here says Jesus? Who here says John Lennon? Okay, and again, we are right here, okay? We have Jesus as the most important, single most important, historically significant figure. Um, the Be all the Beatles, you know, are, you know, still quite impressive. Um, but, uh, but less than that. And they do, if you rank them by significance, fall in the canonical order of John Paul George Ringo, if any of you are Beatles fans. Who's bigger, Elvis Presley or Ludwig von Beethoven? We're interested here in historical significance. Who here says Elvis? A few who says Beethoven. Okay. Turns out Beethoven is ranked historically more significant, although Elvis is actually quite high uh, on the order of with Tchaikovsky and substantially ahead of Franz Liszt by our measurement, okay? Who's bigger, um, Eli Whitney or Justin Bieber? Now, who knows, who knows who, who, who's Eli Whitney? Does anyone know who he is? Inventor of the cotton gin, a, a pioneering thing for the Industrial Revolution. So who's bigger, Eli Whitney or Justin Bieber? Um, okay, who says Eli Whitney? Who here says Justin Bieber? And there's a mix here, and part of it is a question of what do we mean by significance? Um, if we rank them according to our historical significance measure, Eli Whitney scores substantially more important, more, more significant than uh, Justin Bieber. Justin Bieber falls in the same equivalence class as Frankie Avalon of a teenage idol, you know, popular at that time. Um, 
but by contemporary fame, which is another sort of byproduct of our analysis. Certainly more people have probably heard of Justin Bieber walking around the streets than, uh, than, than Eli Whitney. And so we can kind of get that kind of a measure. So who's bigger, Mark Zuckerberg or Jesse Eisenberg? Okay, who says Zuckerberg? Who says Eisenberg? Okay, that much, that much is clear. Okay, so we have Mark Zuckerberg ranked around 7,500th um, in uh, historical significance. Who's bigger, Larry or Sergey? Okay, so um, who here says Sergey? Who here says Larry? Okay, so um, what do we decide? So we actually have them in terms of historical significance. We have Larry somewhat ranked somewhat higher than Sergey. Again, lower is better in these kind of rankings. Um, but by, by fame, by in terms of the man on the street recognition, we actually have Sergey Brun a little bit higher than, uh, than Larry Page. Um, and again, you can see them in perspective. Both of them rank higher than Eric Schmidt, okay, in terms of our historical significance measures. Um, here are the top 20 people of all, all time. And so if you look at these figures, you'll see these are really sort of heavyweights of history that we sort of are able to pull out as being the most significant people in history by our measures here. Um, so why are we doing this? One reason we're doing this is, um, you know, there, there is in, you know, increasing interest in, you know, trying to apply big data kind of techniques to studying things in the social sciences. You know, we have, again, my, my, my let's say, real interest that this sort of falls out of is sort of news and blog analysis. And we have collaborations with sociologists to try to interpret, you know, what can you learn about the frequency and sentiment of individual people when you're analyzing them in a news corpus over time, you know, for large amounts of things. So basically, we look to, uh, to, to do this kind of analytics to help understand social forces. And part of this has been, out of this is one of the things that's inspired the, the uh, work I'm talking about today. But I do believe there are sort of more computer science-y kind of applications to this that might be interesting. Um, you know, Twitter users are familiar with clout scores. How important is this tweeter, you know, if they do this thing? You can think that what we are doing is trying to build a clout score for people outside of Twitter, you know, who has more clout than the other. Um, you can imagine using significance measures to try to disambiguate, you know, between, you know, entities' names, you know, often collide between multiple people, and there might be multiple senses of whether an entity is important. And so trying to identify the real, when you see a Larry Page reference, do you mean the real Larry Page or do you mean an obscure British entertainer? That kind of thing. If you know who's more significant, you can help make those kind of decisions. You can measure documents for how esoteric the content is. You know, there's readability measures that measure sort of things like grammar, but there's also ideas of subject readability, which are probably functions somewhat of how obscure what they're dealing with. And we'll talk about some um, applications here where we're going to use it to try to identify biases in um, documents and people and uh, things like that um, because we can serve as some kind of a reference standard for significance. So, okay, so now uh, let me tell you about our methodology. Again, you guys um, are used to ranking documents on the Internet by importance. That's sort of what Google does for a living. Um, Ranking people is done, you know, reasonably often. When you hire somebody, you have a hiring pool, and you rank them from best to worst. That's basically what you do. College admissions things rank people. So there are lots of times when people, you know, of, of situations in the world where people are ranked based on quality or significance. And um, the standard approaches wouldn't scale to the kind of analysis we can do. People can do expert polls. You know, is George Washington more important than Chester Arthur? Um, you know, you're going to have the public vote. But, of course, the public doesn't know about a lot of different things. So, you know, there's limits to what crowdsourcing could be. Trying to have the crowd, the, you know, crowdsource the difference between various Elizabethan poets would be a hard thing to do. Um, or you can start to build models, and this is kind of the way that we would be doing it. So our goal here is we're going to start from a historical universe of Wikipedia. Um, Wikipedia has a population roughly equal to San Francisco. There's about 800,000 people with Wikipedia pages. Um, and, uh, you know, by our measures, we can rank each, all of them from most to least significant. Our least significant person was a Serbian canoeer, okay, who had won a bronze medal in some uh, non-Olympic event. Um, he's one of the two guys on the right. Nobody knows who, okay, but that's, that's him. Um, and so what we're going to do is derive our significance measures from um, various Wikipedia quantities. Um, the first 
let's say a sort of factor that we're going to use is, Wiki, is PageRank, which I imagine some of you people have heard of here. Um, you know, um, and obviously PageRank is, you know, a Google thing, and uh, it's used to ranking, you know, used to rank sources, uh, you know, by, by, in some sense, by importance on the Internet. Um, we can do the same thing with Wikipedia. You know, Wikipedia pages are, uh, you know, are vertices of a graph, and there's links between one wiki page and another one. If you're a person who has links to your Wikipedia page for many other important people, you're probably important. And so by using Wikipedia, we can compute the centrality of people. And when we do that, yes. Okay, so that's, that, okay, you'll see that in a minute. Okay, so at the moment, I'm not ignoring topic pages, okay? And so this is, um, first of all, using the, all the pages in Wikipedia. And when you do it, we to understand how effective the factor is, we've identified, you know, a thousand prominent people, okay, well-known people, and uh, look to see who does best or worst in this cohort among that, that measure. So by page rank in Wikipedia, you get some very good, you know, some, some obviously some heavy hitters as among the people of highest page rank. The people of lowest page rank tend to be very young celebrities, okay, um, you know, uh, who I suspect you guys know better than I do. Um, but um, you see some kind of anomalies. Why is Linnaeus, who here knows who Carl Linnaeus is, yeah? Okay, so he was the uh, original biological taxonomist, and he's one link from every species page. So, you know, really implicitly, if you're allowing subject pages, that's really what you're asking, you're allowing dinosaurs to vote, you're allowing all kinds of other species to vote. And, um, you know, if you now restrict uh, page, the graph to only people pages, you get a somewhat different uh, factor, okay? And again, here we see, you know, now we see, you know, standard heavyweights here. Interestingly, people who start becoming relatively low ranked by people page rank are people like uh, Richard Stallman and Jimmy Wales, you know, who are, you know, uh, the GNU people and the Wikipedia people. And the reason is because they're, they're, you know, they're more associated with big, organ you know, prominent organizations and products than they are with other people. And um, so both of these page ranks mean something. We're going to use both of them in our final computation. Another factor that we might use to build a, a fame model would be Wikipedia hits, okay? We would expect that if you are an important person, more people will want to read your Wikipedia page than, um, than other people would. And um, Wikipedia hits are kind of orthogonal to page rank. Wikipedia hits measures the interest of readers, uh, whereas page rank would measure the interest of writers. Yeah. Well, we're going to, uh, we'll get, right now we're just looking at what are our raw inputs, okay? And we'll talk about how we mean, so the answer is they're going to be inputs to both, in, basically they're, both, they're all going to be inputs to both, okay? But how we're going to, you'll, you'll see where the, the, the fame comes up from significance, yeah. No, so you can get the, the hits data from Wikipedia Foundation. So, uh, so this is available to download and we have gotten it. And so this is actually an interesting, it's, it's an interesting data source to have, okay? Um, and when you do it, who are the top people? Again, if you look at the uh, prominent people uh, by Wikipedia hits, most of them, again, are modern celebrities and things like that. Somewhat upsettingly and surprisingly, the only non-contemporary person who fits in there turns out to be Hitler. Um, you know, when you look at the important but low number of hits people, you tend to see things like Canadian prime ministers and Australian prime ministers and things like that, okay, as being you know, sort of stalwart figures, but not ones that, that people are actively reading about so much. Um, so we can use hits. We can also use the article length of a Wikipedia document as a feature. In principle, we would expect that a more important person would have a longer Wikipedia article. And, um, you know, in, in, you know, standard traditional printed wiki, uh, encyclopedias, it was clear that length of a uh, document was a scarce resource. That shouldn't be true in the Wikipedia era, but there are still, you know, forces in Wikipedia that, that you know, th there is definitely a community that wants to enforce notions of brevity and conciseness and appropriateness. So, um, you know, there are over 100,000 people who've had their pages removed from the, uh, what you call, Wikipedia. Usually they wrote them themselves and stuff like that. But So the community is definitely trying to delete things that are redundant and excessive for a personality. And so length is somewhat of an interesting measure. So who do we see as the most 
long, the people with the longest and shortest Wikipedia articles. Um, in general, the longest articles belong to very, well, you know, controversial, relatively controversial figures or people with constituencies. You know, uh, L. Ron Hubbard, you know, of Scientology has a constituency. Um, unfortunately, Hitler has a constituency. Um, uh, you know, so uh, Che Guevara has a constituency. Um, if you look at the people with low, um, short, relatively short article lengths, you end up getting certain cont celeb contemporary people who probably haven't done that much to merit their fame. And certain, you know, ancient uh, figures like Euclid and Euripides, of whom very little is known. Yeah. What? This is, we are interested in the text. Here we are counting the text. We are, have deleted the info. I believe in this measure we've deleted the info boxes. We've deleted the index, you know, the uh, bibliographic sections of it. This is, I think, supposed to correspond just to text. You know, we've, uh, you know, we've, you know, we, we've uh, looked at all of them, but this is, I think, the factor that we're most interested in. That's finding most meaningful. Any questions? Okay. Another measure would be Wikipedia page edits, okay, that... Uh, you know, anybody's allowed to edit Wikipedia. You would expect that if you're a well-known, um, significant person, more people will know about you, more people have something to contribute about you, more people will care, um, and uh, therefore you'll probably get more edits. Again, who do we see as being high edit people? We see people, um, again, with, you know, with, with constituencies, controversial figures, uh, religious figures, tend to generate a large number of edits, probably their flame wars back and forth between constituencies, whereas the low edit people are people, you know, who for the most part have been dead for a thousand years or aren't generating very much new, new, new material. So what did we do with all of this stuff? Okay, we would, um, we, we uh, combined them using a technique called statistical factor analysis. Um, the idea is somehow that we've got, again, a bunch of different measurements, a bunch of different observations, and we'd like to identify a small number of statistical you know, of sort of underlying factors that are generating the variance here. Um, so again, my analogy is if you had a bunch of measurements for a tux, you know, you can measure your length, your shoe size, all these kind of things. The main two factors that govern and probably predict a lot of your other measurements on a tux are basically something about how wide you are and how tall you are. Um, and, you know, again, Spearman, you know, originally used this developed factor analysis so that he could, you know, prove that there was one underlying notion of intelligence um, measured on a bunch of, you know, as a result of all these different intelligence tests. So when we do a factor analysis, we discover that there are, you know, um, two primary factors that pop out of this thing, okay, that ex both explain roughly equal amounts of the variance, okay? And when we look at it, these factors tend to have a natural interpretation. One of these factors loads very mostly on the uh, page rank variables, and that's going to correspond to something that we kind of think of as gravitas, serious accomplishment. Um, whereas the other factor loads largely on things like page hits and revisions, and this seems to correspond more to a notion of you know gross public fame, uh, celebrity, things like that. So we tend to call that celebrity, and. Um, our notion of fame and significance is going to be a sum of these, uh, these, these factors. So the, the ratio of what your reputation is of fame versus gravitas does enable us to distinguish between different kinds of people. The people on the left have the you know, gr greatest amount of this gravitas factor. And if you look at that, they, they all tend to be serious, stolid figures in history. The people with the greatest percentage of their renown coming from... Um, fame from, from, from you know, celebrity is this, you know, our, our wrestlers and things like that. If you look at it, again, the, the size of the bar, Britney Spears is the only one of this bunch that has even a slight amount of gravitas to her. And, you know, we don't think of her as a high gravitas figure here. So this is kind of, to me, kind of interesting. We have a tool to distinguish between, you know, a comp, you know in some sense what we think of as accomplishment and in some sense what we seem to think of as celebrity. Um, and in fact, our notion of fame, the question of what, what is, do we mean by fame, our basic notion of fame is just adding up these celebrity and gravitas factors. That's basically what we mean by fame. So when I talked about the fame of figures, that's what we wanted to do. But if we measure fame like this, we find that uh, we overemphasize people of this time. Okay? By this measure of fame, Britney Spears is more famous than Aristotle. 
which certainly does not correspond to a notion of significance that we would like to think of historically. Um, you know, by our notion, 28 of the most significant, most famous individuals of all time would still be alive, and that, that we think is overestimating it. So we wanted to try to build a model that would factor in reputation decay. You know, our general sense is Britney Spears 100 years from now will probably not be as known as Aristotle. We kind of have an image that, that her, her, her level of fame is going to decay. And um, so we might try to factor in a, an idea of a half-life. We might imagine that somebody's fame drops by half every 50 years. And it isn't quite a, that kind of a model, because if so, someone like Jesus would have dropped by you know, a factor of a million or so and become invisible if they really had a half-life. And um, so we, we tried to look at various data sets to try to come up with an accurate model of how is it that reputations decay. And we decided that there were two different processes at work. First, there is a notion of a lapse from living memory. And second, there's some kind of a, contempor a different contemporary bias because of Wikipedia, the advent of Wikipedia. So how could we measure how reputations decay over time? And uh, here you guys came to our aid. Um, there's a Google Ngrams data set that's very interesting, where you, know, uh, you, know, you, you, you guys have scanned all the books that have ever been printed, or some, uh, uh, a non-trivial subset of them, you know, 12% or something like that, and um, have produced a data set of, for each popular Ngram from length one to five, how many times has it occurred in books published each year? you know, from going back two, 300 years to date. And um, based on this, we can get a, a, a fame model to see, you know, if you were famous at a particular time, people wrote books mentioning your name. And so we could start to get plots like this. This would show us what was the relative fame among these revolution women in the Revolutionary War as a function of time. And you start to see interesting things. Who here knows who Betsy Ross was? Who was Betsy Ross? Yeah? What'd she do? Invent, sewed the flag. Now, she did not appear in the historical record at all until 1870. Why do we know she sewed the flag? Well, at one point, her grandson wrote an article, said, yeah, my grandmother, she sewed the flag. And everybody got very excited and started talking about Betsy Ross, OK? So you can measure something like that. Again, she doesn't emerge in our data set until a particular year. Using the engrams, we can figure out when were people talked about, OK? And then we can sort of model, we know for every famous person, when were they alive, when were they born, when did they die, um, how much were they talked about in books as a function of time. We can start to align this thing to try to figure out when do people typically as a cohort achieve their peak fame and how fast does that decay, okay? And based on this, we can build a model uh, that basically gave us, uh, you know, again, we found that famous people you know, decay uh, slowly relative to, to less famous people, okay? We found that the peak of people's fame is typically when they reach about 60 or 75, somewhere in that range, at least as measured by books, and that it decays and levels out. So, you know, 100 years, 175 years in the future, there stops being decay, okay? And this is why we still know about Aristotle and Jesus. At that point, their fame is basically locked in the historical record, and there isn't a further decay. So we can factor in that decay rate. There is another factor that, that, that also seems to occur, which is um, that it is now a lot easier to get into Wikipedia if you're alive today than if you were alive um, 50 years ago. And the way we could tell this is by plotting the death year of people, okay, the frequency of, of people in Wikipedia by their death year. That's sort of our plot over there. And if you compare that to world population, which is the bars here, or the number of people in the, yeah, by, 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 by the, okay, so, so the bars represent the um, number of people who died in Wikipedia each year. The um, black line represents the, the world population, okay? And if you look at this, it amazing, Wikipedia for uh, 200, over 250 years amazingly well fits the distribution. The number of people in Wikipedia is well predicted by the world population, okay? With three little bumps. First bump is World War I. The second bump is World War II. More people died in these wars of historical note than, than normally, so we have more Wikipedia people then. And then since Wikipedia came in, a lot more people are represented in Wikipedia than there should be, okay? And so, um, so based on this, 
we, we can identify that there's a cohort of people here who have a lot more celebrity than they should have. Okay, Gravitas has remained consistent, celebrity hasn't. We have found a way to correct for this thing by subtracting a fixed amount of celebrity from people based on their, their um, peak activity year. And using these two decay measures, we now get a notion of what we mean by significance. Okay, so, so the n-gram stuff would, is um, we are using basically as a, just a measure of, um, you know, just for decay here. Okay, although, um, although obviously it's something we're quite interested in. Okay, again, Gautam here. Okay, my students spend a lot of time you know, experimenting with the n-grams and building a, an interface on it and stuff like this. So we're very interested in the n-gram stuff. Um, but, you know, the n-gram graph has a certain number of limitations. One, one limitation is that, of course, the, data, the public data stops in 2008. So you don't get more recent events there. Um, it also is relatively hard to match names in, uh, you know, in the n-grams, okay? Because certain people, you know, certain, the question of what is Babe Ruth called? Is Babe Ruth Babe Ruth or is Babe Ruth George Herman Ruth, Okay. And people are often referred to under different names. The answer is it's interesting names. For everything we've done here, this is the only, pla it's, this is the only stuff that we have used the n-grams for, for here. Okay? Although in supporting analysis we do, we make a lot of use of the n-grams. So n-grams are good. We think it's very good. But for what I'm talking about here, it's basically only for decay purposes. Okay? Any questions? So okay, so so the answer is you know might yeah, again you know might might celebrity change over time you know the whole notion of celebrity seems to be a somewhat recent thing in world history you know that you know you didn't have broadcast media until you know 1920 or something like this and so you know as we we've, we've looked at this thing this was sort of the way that we felt was the most appropriately way to deal with it you know you want to use the historical evidence like the engram so you're doing something in a in a principled way. You know, there's a certain sense we have that Britney Spears should decay and fall off the earth quicker than other people. But what the real justification one has for this is unclear to me. It is not clear to me that media celebrities will fall off the earth. You know, in a world where, you know, reruns are playing forever on television, it may be that Gilligan's Island, the people in Gilligan's Island will outlive the, you know, Jesus or something. I won't say that. But, uh, but it, so anyway, so, so we don't really take special care to, to correct for that except for this sort of fixed correction for what we think of as Wikipedia effects. So how good is our model? You know, so we come up with a model, and um, again, our model is a first principle thing. It's not a learning thing particularly, but we'd like to assess how well do we do identifying historical significance. And so to do this, we looked at a bunch, uh, collected as many published rankings as we could where people tried to rank historical figures by significance. Some of these are based on, you know, authors writing books, or uh, some of them are based on crowdsourcing, things like the IMDb star meter, okay? And some of them are, you know, based, based on other poll, polls, things like this, it's expert polls, a variety of different sources. And so the question is, how well did our, um, yeah? Right. Well, what we do have, well, but, but we do have, for example, in, in this, so certainly we do, don't do anything explicitly to know about baseball in our model. That much is clear. But we do have things like the baseball star rankings from, from a website. So our gold standard here was basically we're trying to come up with as many different published rankings as we could. That was sort of our, our goal. You know, not, nothing, nothing, nothing that I think you would agree was meaningful was excluded. Okay, you know, occasionally we, we would download something that looked like a list, and then you'd see it was a random-looking set of people and, and, and didn't correspond well with anything. Okay? 
So I think this is a fairly honest and representative, it was an honest and representative attempt to come up with as many rankings as possible. That is, that is the goal here, okay? And, um, you know, and so we were going to use these as a gold standard to try to assess them. So what happens if we do that? Oh, just, do I get a, uh, I don't know, um, no. So what, what do we end up getting? So the interesting um, variables here are, uh, what is the rank correlation, the Spearman rank correlation? of our rankings with the, you know, with each, with it, with these lists. And what we're able to do is um, our, here we're comparing us, uh, again, what are we comparing? Here is the normal phase bracket, the first phase bracket, the HX, the uh, um, length of the article, I In all of the categories, our uh, decayed model achieves a better uh, correlation with the published rankings than, um, than, you know, than uh, any of the other models that we had. Um, now, the numbers here may still not look very high to you. You may want you know, numbers to be very high. But one thing to notice is that these ranking lists had a lot of disagreement among themselves. You might imagine the list of the greatest Italians in the world might put Frank Sinatra ahead of Mussolini where somebody else might put Mussolini ahead of Frank Sinatra. And there's a certain amount of uh, inconsistency among these things. And basically, the interlist correlation among all of these lists, if you just took the people that were on more than one list and you look at these correlations, the interlist correlation of this was, was 0.49. Our correlation with the list was higher than that. Okay, so in some sense, our rankings are in some sense central to relative to the, all the rankings that we publish. And so I feel reasonably justified in saying that our rankings are, I think, more meaningful of what the set of ensemble of them are trying to capture than that themselves. So with presidents, I mean, uh, if we take a look at this one, which were the president's lists here? Um, these were the rankings of the Final uh, correlation up here was 0.65. It's better on the president than um, than uh, than than you know than any of the individual measures did. Okay. Yeah. Still substantially. Okay. So in this case, you're right. We are doing worse on the president than we did on the uh, you know on on the human rankings. The president rankings that we had, we had three sets, five sets of president rankings. The agreement among these was, in fact, higher than, than, than the agreement on ours. Okay? So that, that, that's certainly true. Well, talking about the planning and questions, there's a little bit of what you have to do for the first time. Yeah. 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 Yeah
So one is that the trend that decline is the decline of the great scientist, okay? Um, everyone in this room knows people who won the Nobel Prize in 19, 1900, you know, from 1900 to 1920. You guys all know Einstein and Heisenberg and all of these kinds of people. Um, if I asked you to name a Nobel Prize winner from the last 20 years in the sciences, okay, I don't think many of you here, I, I would be very surprised if any of you could name more than two or three of them, okay? There is a sense we have that somehow as public figures, scientists are a less significant bunch, less recognizable bunch as historical names and figures than they were before. So how can we quantify it? So here we have a graph where the x-axis is the, um, what you call it, the, uh, the, the year, okay, that they won their prize. The y-axis is the, uh, you know, the measure of significance, it's, you know, uh, not the ranking, but the uh, measure of significance. And um, we, we, we show what is the significance of these people, okay, who won each class of Nobel Prize. And the physicists are more important, more prominent, more significant than the, the chemists and the, and the medicine prize winners, okay, historically. And again, I think that would be borne out if you looked at the roster of people who you know about. Um, in recent years, since the Nobel Prize in economics came out, that's actually, those people have a higher profile than the... Um, you know, what you call then the, then the physics, then the scientific winners, okay? Um, you see an effect where the um, quality of all of these prize winners goes down fairly quickly after you in initialize the prize. Part of that is a backlog because these fields have, you know, backlogs of great people who they can award the prize to at the beginning that they have to use up before they give it to newer scientists. But, but even so, you see a decline here that you don't see among the Peace Prize winners or the Literature Prize winners. These people have retained the same level of stature that they have historically had. Okay, and so there is something different. Scientists are not becoming public figures the way that, uh, that, that um, they used to and the way that people in other disciplines are. That's one thing we can quantify. You can look at the history of the papacy. I don't want to go into that. Here's another Google Ngrams plot, if you guys, if you guys like your Ngrams. But um, a second application we looked at was sort of the question of who belongs in a history textbook. Um, you know, you, you know, history. You know, people who people hear about historically are people in textbooks. Okay, you would expect that um, that you know who is in a textbook. Are they the people who should be in textbooks? Um, my daughter is in fifth grade. Was in fifth grade when we started doing this study. Um, her history textbook had 250 names referenced, okay, in a, in, a, uh, you know, in a glossary of who you should know about, who you have to study for. And a typical assignment would be compare the person to the, what their description was. I was astonished that among the 250 people were figures like this, who I'd never heard of. Is there anyone in this room who has heard of any of these five people? Okay. And yet they are deemed as people that my fifth, grade, fifth grader in some sense should study. Okay, should know who they are. Um, these were the people, if you look on the left, are the most important, significant people in her textbook. The people on the right were the least significant people in her textbook. And as you can see, there is a, a wild difference between, I don't think, you know, again, there's a big difference between the people on the left and the people on the right. Um, so you can start to ask, what is the quality of the people in her textbook? And you start seeing a phenomenon like this, you know, Roughly half the figures appear in the top 20, 1,000 most significant people in the world history. Um, but you end up getting a tale of 35 people who are, you know, quite insignificant, quite idi idiosyncratic choices that really shouldn't be in a fifth grade textbook, okay? And this kind of provides a tool to try to analyze these things. You know, we tried to figure out why were these in there? Were they state standards run them up? And that didn't, yeah. U.S. history class. What? Well, okay. So what? You, okay. So if what you're saying is that you have to teach U.S. history, and there's a thousand great U.S. figures, uh, you know, uh, you know, to a hundred great historical figures in the U.S., and then there's a hundred others you should learn about who are wildly less significant. That's true. But what we would expect is that in a U.S. history book, these there, there are plenty of historical figures of interest. You know, in this in this range between where where I would say they are, where we would. Okay, but conditioned on United States. What I will tell you is the straightness of this line up here shows you this is the the, the, the relative significance of the 
That's the phenomenon here, okay? Again, when we look at it, it turns out that there is a certain amount of political correctness here, that, they, that a lot of the, in, the figures that were insignificant historically by our measure were put in were representatives of minority groups and things like that. Um, but we were able to. Could the remote offices please mute their mics? Sorry. Um, but we were able to identify for each group people who were excluded who would have been more worthy to include. So if you want to write a history textbook, you should r run your, your people through our, uh, you know, what you want, through our measure. And, um, you know, and again, in each one of the groups that were, we thought they had a lot of bad, rep you know, uh, representatives who probably shouldn't be there. In fact, there were other people who were more worthy of inclusion. And so we would have done that. Um, in fact, this gets into what I think is a, an, an interesting question. It's a question of how good are human selection processes, okay? You know, in principle, when you're writing a textbook or doing something like this, you're choosing who do you want to put in, canonize in your book or something like this. How good are people at making these kind of decisions? Um, you know, you guys have to make hiring decisions. You have a pool of applicants to Google, okay? And you want to select the best ones. How good a job do you do of it? I know this is something you guys study a lot, but it's I claim that the stuff we that that thinking in terms of organizations that have tried to canonize historical figures, how well do they do at doing identifying the right ones provides a sort of a laboratory to study this. So let me let me go through this kind of idea quickly. There is in New York a uh, a Hall of Fame for Great Americans, which starting in 1900 every five years tried to say who were the greatest Americans to honor, um, and they would have elections. And the people on the left were among the 100 people they ended up selecting as the greatest Americans of all time. And those are all great Americans. The people on the right were also selected as among the 100 greatest Americans of all time. And I will believe that um, probably no one in this room knows, and, well, knows more than one of these people on the list. Okay? And Hall of Fame selections are interesting. It's not like a draft problem where you don't know if this person's going to do in the future. Every person you're selecting in here was dead 25 years before you picked them. They weren't going to go and do great things afterwards, okay? Somehow, when faced with the choices of who can I pick as the greatest Americans, they came up with the people on the right. And, you know, by studying these things, you can see that often they had much better people to choose from, okay, by our contemporary historical significance, okay? That's basically what this is showing and again, we get a similar phenomena that for two thirds of their choices, they pick the best people or very high quality people. And, but there is a very long tail. A third of the people they're picking are, you know, there, there are thousands of people, you know, hundreds to thousands of people below them that, that would have been better choices that they chose to not to pick. We see a similar phenomenon when you look at sports hall of fames, which try to select things. You have a People on the left who are very well-known baseball players. People on the right are people that most baseball players and fans would never have heard of. And a similar phenomenon. There is a straight line here. You know, a certain um, fraction, you know, 70%, 60% are clearly quality. And then the quality tapers off. And we think this is sort of a more general phenomena here. That, uh, that, that whenever you have an expert panel try to fix things, okay, that somehow there's some, some noise in measurement. And the result, the noise in measurement doesn't really affect the people who are really the great at the tail. You have to be really blind to not think George Washington is a great American. But when you start getting to the tail, you know, a certain amount of noise that you have ends up wildly affecting the position of candidates. And my sense is the same thing happens, presumably the same process you see has happened with job hiring and college admissions. So if I look around the room, those of you who are Google employees, if the same phenomena holds, one third of you don't belong here. There should be someone in the pool who was much better than you, okay, who could have been chosen, but they didn't, okay, if you extrapolate from these kinds of things. Um, you can look at the question of how are women represented in Wikipedia? Or should there be more women historically in the historical record? 
Or are they over? Are they underrepresented or are they overrepresented? How might we get a handle on it? Um, on one level, you could do is first order statistics. Say, well, you know, 50% of people are women, 15% of the people in Wikipedia are women, women are underrepresented. But there might be an argument that, well, perhaps they didn't do the accomplishments that uh, would, would have brought them note, okay? And that maybe the right fraction of women in Wikipedia is right. How might we get some kind of a handle on, on this kind of an issue? So my theory is the following. Um, we can look at this through the idea of a significance rank. Um, we agree that Wikipedia members are outliers in the population. You know, the number of people who are just outside of Wikipedia quality is much larger than the people that are in it. So you certainly could put more people in Wikipedia if you wanted to. Um, the real question is, are men in, significant, in Wikipedia more significant than women? If the men in Wikipedia are more significant than the women, then that would be an argument that, you know, in general, the, 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 the pool of women isn't as strong, okay? On the other hand, if the women are more significant, that would mean that if you wanted to have the same standards of significance, you could admit more women to Wikipedia while maintaining standards. And if we partition people into cohorts based on their birth year, we find that historically women have required far more historical significance than men to get into Wikipedia. Okay, so if you plot the x-axis is birth year, the y-axis is significance, the dashed line is women's female significance, the, the, the dark line is uh, male significance. For much of recorded history, women have required much more in the way of significance. The average woman in his Wikipedia of a time is much more significant than the average man in Wikipedia. And it, if you do the analogous computation, it's equivalent of like they have to be four, four IQ points smarter, okay, to be a woman in Wikipedia than a man, historically. Any questions about that? Final thing, again, um, you know, uh, there's a question of, you know, if you wanted to become historically significant and you had money, how would you do it? Um, you know, uh, Medici, Lorenzo de' Medici is famous as a philanthropist, much more than as a ruler of Florence. What would you do if you wanted to become, you know, convert your money to fame? How should you do it? One way to do it is to endow a prize, okay? That uh, certain people we know in the world history are, are famous, you know, Nobel is famous for the Nobel Prize. You know, the Fields Medal, you know, yes? So you're saying that Nobel is basking in the glory of, uh, is that a, is that, yeah, is that, we were basically so one of your majors was this like people to people, page right, rank right, 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 right. Um, does Alfred Nobel pick up page rank from the pages? My of guess, the it, my Prize assumption winners? is he certainly does. He certainly picks up glory from the Nobel Prize winners. It probably says there's undoubtedly a link from somebody, Nobel Prize winner to the Nobel Prize page. And from the Nobel yeah. Prize page, there's probably a link, there's a link to Nobel. So I have no doubt that he picks up reflected glory from the people who win his prize, okay? And so that a lot of this, this, this recognizes what he's doing. The other possibility is to start a university, that uh, if you have enough money to endow a university and get a university named after you, that's a great way to get a, a good historical fame rank. And so uh, I figure my university, Stony Brook, could probably have its names rights bought for about $1 billion. So if you're in a position to do that. Okay, so what are we doing? Again, what is our work now? Again, we're interested in um, trying to do this kind of analysis in a cross-cultural way. Wikipedia is in, you know, 40-odd languages or, or, or even more. Um, to what extent can we remove some of the cultural biases we have by doing our analysis in other languages, uh, in, in other Wikipedias? And this is something that we're starting to work at. Um, we're interested in applying this, you know, working with sociologists to, to apply this in a variety of different ways to study gender bias and cumulative advantage. Um, we're interested in, again, more stuff with the Google n-grams. We analyze the n-grams a lot. We're interested in doing things like assembly and, and sentiment analysis on these n-grams, okay? And um, this is something we're interested in. We'd like to extend this idea of ranking people and places and things beyond Wikipedia but to all the people on the web, okay? You know, again, I'm, I'm not in Wikipedia at this moment. I don't have any significance according to our measure. Could we figure out what my significance is by doing some kind of a web crawl and web analysis there? And that's something we're interested in. And finally, we're interested in taking this analysis and writing a book on it. And so we've been 
trying to look at to what can we learn about world history through these kinds of analyses. And that's my other project here. And that's basically all I wanted to say. Um, oh, so we have some resources if you want. We have a web page, whoisbigger.com, if you want to play with some of our rankings. The decayed significance isn't on here yet, but I encourage you to go take a look and play with it. Um, we also have an app if you enjoyed playing the Who's Bigger game at the beginning. You can go to look up our app and play with this thing. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank the people I work with, uh, who work with me on this. Again, the people who matter most here um, would be Charles Ward. He's my postdoc, and he's going to be coming to work here in a few months. And um, Gautam here uh, is the one that did our work with our engrams, okay, and helped prepare the engrams data, which you can see from the Who's Bigger site as well. And that's where I think I'd like to leave it. Yes? Yeah. Right. Uh, so, doesn't, wouldn't, wouldn't it be safe to say that Wikipedia probably suffers from the same problem that your data set? You know, a third, a third of it's like very A lot of people are missing. Okay, so, so the question, let, okay, so you're saying that how, we're based on Wikipedia, how good or bad is Wikipedia is, I guess, implicitly what your question is. And, and to me, as I've done this, I have become more and more impressed with how good Wikipedia is. You know, there are certain things that Wikipedia would get right that it doesn't seem obvious that it would get right. Like, for example, the, the, the matching between the frequency of people that it's talked about in world population going back hundreds of years, okay? That's a sign that somehow, you know, it is, that that's something that shouldn't happen, you know, if Wikipedia is really being produced, you know, uh, in, a, in, a ran, you know in a random way. Yeah. Maybe the question might be like a deeper one. Yeah. Okay, so so let's think. So so one other thing you might be saying is maybe it's the tail of the distribution. Uh, okay, so what do I say here? We have eight hundred thousand people in Wikipedia. You haven't seen a significance rank flashed up higher than four hundred thousand, which means that there is you know among any pe person we had thir thought of or heard of or anything like that, these people are all falling on the second half of the distribution. To me, that tells me that, that I think Wikipedia has the significant people. We have not found anyone in the course of our studies that, let's say, we felt was missing from Wikipedia. Okay? That's, I guess, m sort of my answer to what you're saying. I don't know if that's quite what you want to... So I don't think that people here are being missed. Um, you might say that the measures that are being... You know, the, the aesthetic here is not the right aesthetic, that what Wikipedia values may not be sort of what is historically significant. But... The people that come up at the top of the lists are the people that I think should come up at the top of the list. They correlate well to what you see in these published rankings. And so my sense is that there's some meaning here. Yeah. Is it just great dead white males? So, I mean, they are, you know, let, let, let's think how to say this thing. Um, so when we looked at, for example, um, you know, in the history book, actually the fifth grade history book, you know, that um, nine of the top 100 figures by historical significance in, uh, what you call it, um, my daughter's textbook were, were black, okay? So it's not all white males at tops. You know, there, there is a sizable cohort of figures who, you know, are not white, who do fall into the, you know, reach prominence in Wikipedia by our measure. Now, obviously, there are cultural biases here. If, you know, certainly in terms of international figures, you would not expect them to be as well represented in, um, you know, in an English Wikipedia than others. Yeah. So, it, so it is certainly true that, um, that, that different parts of the world would have different penetration. That would be true. Um, this is one reason why we'd like to try, you know, looking at Wikipedias from different languages. Because presumably, you know, if you look at an African language, I suspect that the Wikipedia you know, access there is more probably from, from those countries than, than elsewhere. So there are, are probably, there are, are biases there. But obviously the, you know, most of what we're interested in is the Anglo, you know, Anglo-speaking world. And I think these are pretty well represented here. Anything else? Yeah.
So we have, we have looked, thanks to Google and their scanning things, we have looked at um, the indices of historical textbooks from uh, going back 1900 or so. You know, the whole notion of a history textbook is not a, is a relatively recent invention, okay? It goes back to, you know, 1900 or so. And, um, you know, we, we, did, we didn't conclude anything particularly interesting when we looked at that. So the answer is, have we thought about, you know, how much of this is, you know, and, and are older history books possibly an interesting way to look at it? The answer is yes. We haven't made it, found anything particularly revealing there. No, nothing worth mentioning. That's what I feel. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>